Yeah, so actually I'm broadcasting from the building where Chespov Miłosz had his office for many years. And there used to be a parking spot uh, in the back of the uh, back of the building that was that was dedicated for his use along <laughs> the Nobel Prize parking spot. Um, uh, so, um, so I, I want to welcome every, everyone who's um, tuning in. Um, my name is John Conley. I'm the director of the Institute for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies. And it's my uh, pleasure to introduce to you today, uh, Cynthia Haven, uh, Stanford University, um, who is a national endowment for the humanities public scholar and uh, also the author of Evolution of Desire, A Life of René Girard from 2018, the first biography of the French theorist, um, who's a great um, inspiration to many of our students. Um, and she's also published uh, two books on Czesław Miłosz, which will be the subject of her remarks today. Um, the first entitled Czesław Miłosz, An Invisible Rope, Portraits of Czesław Miłosz and Czesław Miłosz Conversations. Um, Cynthia has been a Mila, Milena Yesenska uh, Journalism Fellow uh, at the Institute für die Wissenschaften von Menschen in Vienna, as well as a visiting writer and scholar at Stanford's Division of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages. Uh, she was also a Vogelein, this is very Austrian, um, fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. Um, her writings have appeared in the Times Literary Supplement. Uh, she's also contributed to the New York Times Book Review, The Nation, The Wall Street Journal, The Virginia Quarterly Review, The Washington Post, the LA Times, and other pop uh, publications. And I, I, I should note that she, she runs one of the finest, uh, most worthy of reading blogs there is out there, which is called, I think, Bookhaven. Is that right? Bookhaven right. dot, I don't know, com or edu. But Bookhaven that, dot Stanford dot edu. Uh, yeah. So I'll get a plug in for that. I always enjoy uh, reading that. It's it's remarkable. It's It's been around for a number of years and it's a great guide to uh, many issues in current culture and literature not least of which um, is a long-standing interest that Cynthia's had in, in Polish literature and, and personalities in Polish Polish culture. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Cynthia. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, I hope we mentioned I can, I can show my newest book. It's just out. Is this, uh, is this gonna be your image? Czesław mm -hmm. uh, Miłosz, A California Life. And that's the book I'm here to talk about today. Um, the title of this talk is One of Us and Not One of Us. And it's true, he was one of us and yet not one of us. Czesław Miłosz was an American citizen, an American poet and writer, and an eminent professor of the University of California, Berkeley, all of you. And he's still its only Nobel Prize winner in the humanities. Yet the irony is that the greatest California poet and certainly one of America's greatest poet too, could well be a Pole who wrote only a single poem in English, and that was Turaja Rao. I'm told that few people remember him now at Berkeley, so let's begin with a general introduction. He was born in 1911 on his family's Lithuanian manor among the Polish speaking gentry. His literary career took him to Warsaw and after its destruction during the war to a diplomatic post in the United States where he served the Stalinist government of Poland in New York and Washington and eventually Paris, where he defected in 1951. Nearly a decade later, he was invited to UC Berkeley. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1980. And with the birth of a free Poland, he repatriated and spent his last four years in Krakow before he died uh, in 2004. Was he Polish, Lithuanian? American, all three really. He had a hybrid identity despite himself. I interviewed him in the year 2000, the last to do so before he returned to Poland forever. I've talked about him all over the world, most recently at City Lights and at the University of Chicago. But now uh, I'm at ground zero, UC Berkeley where he had a longer residence than anywhere else in his life. I am speaking from the heyday officers, my publisher, uh, that's Berkeley. So I'm just across the town, for, town from you. 
So let me start, start by sharing a few uh, stories and reflections on his life in Berkeley. But I must begin the story in Paris, 1951. He was the first writer of such intellectual distinction um, and creative distinction to defect from the Soviet Union, Soviet bloc rather, and the first to give his reasons publicly in a press conference, saying that a lie is the source of all crime and that the paramount duty of a poet is to tell the truth. In those first feverish weeks after defection, he wrote Captive Mind, a searing dissection of what happens to the human mind under totalitarianism. It is a classic and um, still perhaps the book for which he is best known. And it's not a book of poetry. He was stranded in France uh, because of his defection. His pregnant wife, Yanka and son were left behind in Washington, DC. Emigre uh, groups in the US were livid, writing letters to the government, protesting his possible arrival, the arrival of a diplomat from communist Poland. These were the years of the Red Scare, remember? And Miłosz was compelled to live by his pen as a result. It's a hard scrabble life for anyone, but in Paris where the intelligentsia were solidly pro-Stalin, he suffered social isolation as well as poverty. How dark was this time? In the Beinecke archive, I was moved by one particular letter, which must have been a humiliating one for Miłosz to write. He discusses what he calls a personal problem. He wrote to the director of the Harvard International Seminar, who also directed a special studies project for the philanthropic Rockefeller Brothers Fund. They had discussed possible student exchanges during his time as a cultural attache, but this time Miwosh is begging. And here's what he wrote. I shall be very grateful if you indicate me a foundation able to offer me a grant for creative work. If I seek your advice, it is because I do not know anybody among the personnel of the foundations and have not the slightest idea how to proceed in such a case. Nor do I see anybody more competent than you in these matters. I am sorry for occupying you with my private affairs. The young Harvard professor was Henry Kissinger. We don't know what reply, if any, he received. Help would come from another quarter altogether. The following year, Berkeley extended an invitation to the poet. He gave a polite refusal in 1959, but he was astonished next year when they renewed the offer again, and he came to Berkeley. And that move made everything possible. Miwosh, an oceanic thinker as well as a poet, spent four decades of his life, the bulk of his literary career here. His Nobel, his world fame, his stability, his enormous output of poems, essay, and translation made Polish one of the world's most important literary, lang literary languages and literacy legacies rather. And it was a result of these events that brought him here. He never knew how he got the invitation, but the department chair, Francis Whitfield, knew quality when he saw it. Like his friend and fellow noblest Joseph Brodsky, he had never been a teacher. And suddenly he was teaching Americans at a major university. So what did his students make, from, make of him? Uh, here's one, and I will read it from my book. You may recognize the name of this student. Richard Lurie walked into Miwosh's classroom in autumn 1960, the very first class the poet would teach. The 20 year old was unkempt and disheveled. It was still the beatnik era, a precursor to the revolt that would overwhelm the campus within a few years. He remembers meeting the very dashing figure of the man he used to call Mr. Miwosh. He said, Cheswav was a good teacher. He was grateful for the job, which paid a human wage after the deprivation of his years in France, he recalled. He had a very strong, dutiful, and conscientious side, which compelled him to do anything he undertook thoroughly and well. Certainly, there was a sense of theater about the poet's self-presentation. 
Uh, Richard Lurie continues, he wore his dark raincoat over his shoulders cape-like. His chestnut hair with glints of red and blonde was brushed straight back. His foxtail eyebrows were always raised in amusement or amazement or alarm. And the Slavic brogue was irresistible. <laughs> it was certainly irresistible for him. The class would revolutionize Richard Lurie's life. He would go on to become an important author in his own right with acclaimed fiction and nonfiction, including the novels, the autobiography of Joseph Stalin and A Hatred of Tulips. He would be a lauded translator of many volumes of Polish and Russian, notably Miłosz's Visions from San Francisco Bay. But that would come later. Lurie's baptism of fire occurred a little bit later in the term. And this is also from my book. Berkeley student Richard Lurie had for a time been an admirer of the dashing Mr. Miłosz, the exiled hero with fathomless layers of grief and gravity. But although he joy enjoyed the classes, there was no ticket price for the exposure, nothing to wound him into being. That would change abruptly one day and he would get a taste of what he had so casually admired. Lurie recalled that in one class, Miłosz did, quote, something that was, for me at least, rather dramatic and would have more than 40 years of consequences. He continued, it was right after the midterms. Corrected in red, our blue books were stacked on his desk. Today, he said, I am going to read aloud one of the blue books without saying whose. It is rather well written, but betrays a typical American lack of any feel for history. Of course, it was Lurie's blue book. He said, I burned with private shame, he recalled, but he reacted with defiance. To hell with him. I'll get one of those. I'll get a sense of history if it kills me. I vowed in the no doubt typical American beliefs that you can always get what you don't have. Later, I was much irritated to learn that for Miłosz, as for Joyce, history had always been a nightmare from which he was trying to awaken. But by then, it was too late. What Miłosz was observing was the absence of what he called historical consciousness, which he described as half history, half a knowledge of evil. He had a natural advantage, if you can call it that. As he said, and this is from Miłosz, I feel that the greatest asset that my part of Europe perceived in the history of the 20th century, the privilege of our being the avant-garde of inhumanity, is that the question of true and false, good and evil, became operative again. Namely, good and evil, true and false, have not been discovered through philosophical discourse, but empirically like the taste of bread. He was a gifted and seminal teacher, but Miłosz wasn't always loved by his Berkeley colleagues. As he told others, he didn't hesitate to dodge developmental duties by playing the stupid peasant. It wasn't laziness. His industry was industriousness was legendary, but rather he had a far sensing Far, uh, a far reaching sense of vision and mission. Here's what he did instead. During these early years, he edited an influential anthology, post war Polish poetry, and also wrote the monumental History of Polish Literature, the rare textbook that could be read for pleasure. The reason Polish literature has achieved a stunning recognition in our times is because of his tireless labor. These names are known to us today because of him. Spigniew Herbert, Wisława Samborska, Anna Sfer, Tadeusz Rzeziewicz, Alexander Watt. He brought many of them, particularly Herbert, into English for the first time. He had help, but he had to create it first. He lived in a nation where he spoke a language that was considered obscure. And so he trained and encouraged a generation of translators, either in the classroom or through friendship. Lillian Valley, Claire Cavanaugh, Richard Lurie, Louis Irabarn, 
Peter Dale Scott, Robert Pinsky, Robert Haas, Berkeley's Bob Haas in particular. Haas explained his good fortune to me in these words. So by accident in the course of this, at an age when I was really too old to have a master anymore, I got to apprentice myself to this amazing body of poetry. I also remember him at the Mivo Centenary in Krakow 10 years ago, when Bob was asked what it was like working with Mivo so closely for so many years, and he responded in a beat, like being alive twice. Here's an example of one of his remarkable literary endeavors, a story that ends with an odd reflection on how Berkeley affected another pole, in this case, the writer and poet, Alexander Vat. He's one of Poland's foremost intellectuals and the author of the Lucifer Unemployed Stories. The former prisoner and memoirist was in frail condition, physically and psychologically, when Miłosz and Berkeley extended an invitation to him in 1963. He rebounded on the Pacific, but the recovery was brief. Depression, self-doubt, and poor health returned. Miwosh attributed the decline to California itself, a place where good and bad interactions had, as Miwosh said, a low level of psychological intensity. While Vat had expected society, debate, engagement, and an audience, he soon realized, as Miwosh explained, quote, that no one had time for long conversations here, that everyone was on his own. You want to give a lecture? Fine, give it. You want to write? Write. You don't want to? So don't. All this creates an impression of indifference, of the individual vanishing into a landscape and masses of people, both of which dwarf him. The impression may often be mistaken, but it can be depressing as it was for Vat. Or in the American vernacular, we'd say, don't make a meal of it. Of course, in Polish literary circles, the meal is precisely the point. The landscape affected Vat too, and he described its, uh, ascribed its demonic powers to the Pacific. He became thin and lethargic and dependent on Perkadin. Lurie, Richard Lurie, Listen to Miwosh's interviews with Vat and Berkeley. As he said, listening with a mix of reverence and bewilderment as Miwosh asked the questions that released the genie of Vat's monologues. The conversations continued in Paris. These interviews were published as the book, My Century. 15 years later, Lurie would translate the book into English. In the New York Times book review, the prominent Polish scholar Jan Gross called it a spiritual biography of a generation of European intellectuals. The book threw a spotlight on the Soviet prisons as Solzhenitsyn had done for the camps, but this passage is overlooked. Vat had been a veteran of the Soviet prisons and he had suffered confinement in the worst of them. They were a quote, commune of male sweat, lice and anxiety, but Lubyanka was the worst. He said, Vat, that is, I would never have believed that you could have suffered to that degree, that acutely, and not die, that you could bear it in Lubyanka. Then he added an aside to Miros. It was to happen again, and perhaps in an even worse form many years later, in your Arcadian Berkeley, where I had ideal living conditions. Very strange. It's a mystery to me. Yes, in Berkeley, it was probably even worse. Keep that in mind. Berkeley, it's worse than the Lubyanka. <laughs> I loved Andre Fernacek's 2017 biography. It's a masterpiece and yet somewhat short on America other than a biographical fact. One phrase stuck, he wrote, it is necessary to slow the pace and expand or dilute the story to present somehow the taste of this California monotony. 
monotony, Berkeley in the 1960s? Are we talking about the same place? Uh, that's about as precise as Lulu Bianca. People often ask me where Mewo stood politically on questions, but he was never a political animal. He said he was against the Vietnam War and often sympathized with the protesters. Yet he felt, as he said, what makes them rage is that they have too much. He was keenly aware of how few rights students had in the Eastern Bloc, and he remembered the book burnings of the Nazis. On one occasion, Miłosz was confronted by protesters who were barricading a path on the campus. And raising his cane, he announced in his best Slav accent, be gone, spoiled children of the bourgeoisie. The crowd made way for him. Miłosz saw much in the times uh, for ridicule. One example, he said the weekly underground paper, the Berkeley Barb, was for him the strangest reading in the world. As it extolled gentleness, goodness, hashish, and various manifestations of the Godhead, yet also 15 minutes of hate in every issue, usually towards anyone with power, from the White House to the local cops. But for the most part, I think he was working on a different scale. He had seen the demolition of Warsaw, and watch half of Europe fall under Stalin's power as the West turned its back. He viewed the world through a wide angle lens, the widest possible, and as a movie, not a screenshot. Mivo had written to Kissinger in 1958, begging for help as he struggled to make a living in exile. But times had changed. Just as the Polish poet's fortunes had risen over the years, so had the fame of his former pen pal, Henry Kissinger of Harvard. The Beinecke Library file included only one other letter to him, Miłosz's short formal message of August 12th, 1975. Miłosz congratulated Kissinger, who had become US Secretary of State for the fulfillment of his personal destiny as a successor to Prince Metternich at the Congress of Vienna. He knew that Kissinger had been fascinated by Metternich and that his dissertation had praised the Conference of Vienna, which stabilized Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. That equilibrium, however, did not benefit Poland. It had remained partitioned with the largest chunk of it under the thumb of the Russian Tsar. History repeats. Kissinger ratified the Helsinki Accords, which consolidated the Soviet Union's grip on post-war territorial gains in Eastern Europe. The agreement confirmed the US policy to withhold recognition from the Baltic states, including Miłosz's Lithuania. It was another slap for Eastern Europe, a revisiting of Yalta. Milton's letter drips with a chilly irony. He reproached Kissinger in unambiguous terms. Quote, this is from the letter. Unfortunately, Thomas Jefferson's advice has been forgotten, he wrote. And then this Lithuanian born Polish poet cited Jefferson's own letter condemning the czar's quote, participation in the demolition of ancient and independent states, transferring them and their inhabitants as farm and stocks of cattle as in a, and uh, to a market for other owners and even taking part in the spoil himself. Miłosz told Kissinger that he had done the same at Helsinki, making the US participate in the plundering of the old world. That was Miłosz's politics, I think, and it changed nothing. He turned, his, turned to his pen, pen instead and he described his own poetry as, a kind of higher politics, an unpolitical politics. And he had a point, as always. Five years later, he would win the Nobel, and that changed everything, too. The immediate consequence is that he got four big duffel bags of mail every day, as well as the legendary Berkeley parking spot that he had asked for and received, establishing a precedent for Nobel winners ever since. <laughs> 
What did he make of life in the Berkeley Hills? Let's go to Grizzly Peak. Here's what he wrote a year after his arrival in 1961. He considered, by the way, his first calling to be not a poet, but a naturalist, and he was a great lover of nature. He wrote, how to begin about this California, something like the Riviera, but on the wild side. All that in spite of the view that I have from my window of five neon cities about as close to us as Paris from the suburbs. The wildness depends on something else, he continued, on the eucalyptus, on the mountains as if they were on the moon, on the desert, on the restless ocean, furiously smashing the cliffs and emptiness, in a word, grandeur, around the foul chemicals above the nearby industrial cities, rattlesnakes and barking seals. That's from a letter he wrote to the influential post-war literary critic, Jan Blonsky. But here's from my own book. Um, let me see if I can find it. I fell in love with the house on Grizzly Peak. And I wrote about it and his love of the deer and his, well, let me see what you think. This is about his home on Grizzly Peak. The last of the eponymous bears is long gone from Grizzly Peak and the land has been reclaimed by the deer that possessed the area way before humans arrived. Now they multiply without predators. Only humans shoo them away as Miwosh did when he wasn't enchanted by them but he was often enchanted. In one poem written near the end of his life, he recalls a moment of wonder. Quote, a deer was too young, just born, has chosen to stay on the lawn outside my window. In the poem, he answers the pessimistic philosopher of despair with his own astonishment at nature. The irises are blooming again and the ocean in the morning is veiled with mist. I tried to find the bush where the incident he described take, took place, but Mark Danner, who now his friend and the journalist who now owns the house that Miwos lived in, laughed, explaining that deer are everywhere on Grizzly Peak and it could have happened anywhere. The deer nibbled relentlessly as Miwosh's, at Miwosh's heliotrope, but not only that, they moved on to the pansies and the roses and the spirea. They chewed away the leaves of a newly planted apple tree, which Miwosh had put into the ground with optimism that quickly yielded to despair. Now Mark Danner says they come to the window to observe him as he works, watching him move through the house, their heads simultaneously moving from left to right and back again, as if following a tennis game. Tennis game. For Mark Danner, these elegant and annoying creatures are forever linked with Miwosh's death. On the morning of August 14th, 2004, Danner went downstairs for coffee and saw an unprecedented sight in the backyard. He counted 13 deer. He said, I had never seen anything like this. And I thought, my God, there's a confab, a paper conclave or something. What is this? In one of the back rooms, the phone began to ring and he heard the voice of Bob Haas. Mark, Mark, pick up, pick up. I don't want to leave this on the machine. I just had a call from Krakow and Cheswav has died. The death wasn't unexpected. Miwosh had been ill for over a month and was after all 93 years old. Danner looked at the convocation of deer that had silently gathered to say farewell to the man who had both opposed and sheltered them. A wave of, overset, of sadness overcame him and he thought, how can I ever get anyone to believe the story that they have gathered here in some way? Then Mark Danner shows me his copy of the collected poems, which bears Miwosh's dedication, dated March 25th, 2002. In the name of all the generations of deer inhabiting Grizzly Peak. Miwosh famously returned to Poland in 2000 he came back only once in grief 
as his wife, Carol, an American more than three decades junior, his junior, was dying in a San Francisco hospital. I'm afraid this place will catch me, he told Hass at the memorial on what would be his last visit to America. He had been proud of being an American citizen, a place where he had been so loved by so many, the place that took him in, that gave him a refuge and a home, financial security and an academic post. Haas told me it was as if he couldn't keep both places in his heart at once. And so he turned against the country that alternately embraced and ignored him. As Haas said, he wasn't always fair. His serene, tender, late life marriage is one reason he turned so fully to America for a time and with her death away from it. Well, it didn't catch him, but I hope he has catcher, captured us, at least a little. Why did I write this book? Because I think we should own him. I think he should be embraced as an American citizen and poet and in a country that is becoming increasingly multicultural and multilingual. He should be taught in American classrooms and memorized by students. And in an age where the ephemeral is displacing the enduring, he will endure. He has given me a gift I can never repay. I have tried, or perhaps my motive was simpler. I simply wanted to extend his stay, to keep him here among us for a little longer, because in the end, he was one of us. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for that magnificent uh, presentation of a book that I <laughs> desperately want to get a hold of. Um, <laughs> There's lots of copies here at Heyday. <laughs> this is good, 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 good to know. And and it was it was a wonderful tribute uh, to 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 me, Wilson Berkeley, but uh, also a revelation in many at many levels uh, about a person who. We we knew in some ways, but uh, you know, as as you noted, he he left for Poland um, sometime in the 1990s, and it seemed that he was he was gone, you know, one more month each year until at some point he just simply didn't come back. And Carol, his wife, uh, Carol Thigpen Miłosz, uh, uh, accompanied him, him him there and and made made a, you know the, the best of it. But I I think that was a, that was a some ways a, sa a sacrifice for her, but. Uh, um, well, I know uh, the story of Carol in Berkeley and uh, Krakow too. He changed Krakow as he changed us. Well, he was also a, a figure that we, we my, my wife were in, and I were in Krakow in the fall of 1998, and we saw them relatively frequently. And when, when you saw Czesław in, in central Krakow, which is relatively small, of course, everybody knew who he was. Uh, at one point, a, a group of school, we were sitting in the window of a restaurant and a group of school kids came by and one of them pointed to him and then the other one pointed to him and suddenly um, there was, well, there was an antiquariat, a used bookstore next next to this restaurant and all the kids went in and bought out all the copies of Miłosz's poetry in that bookstore. And then one by one, they brought it to him to, to sign. Is that the bookstore <laughs> on the Kanonitska? Uh, I, you know, I, I think that might be right. Um, I forget the, I forget, the, I could find it on a, on a map, but uh, at some point, you know, Carol had to protect him. So at some point she shoot off the rest. I think after about the 15th kid had gotten his signature, oh sh shoot off the rest. So it was, a, yeah, no, that was, that was, a, and of course he, he was constantly being visited by, by, by students, master students writing on, on me, was very generous. Uh, but it was as though he had, he had, he'd returned home in a way, which, always made me wonder what he made of those intervening decades in, in the US, um, which is a subject that we can perhaps talk about. But um, in the meantime, I, I wanted to maybe turn to a question we've received. Actually, we've received two questions from the audience. So why don't we go to those and maybe I, I can uh, pose, pose a question or two. Um, I don't know if you can see them, but I'll, I'll read, read, read them out just so that everybody hears them. This is from Elena, uh, Elena Danielson. Um, Whitfield, so Francis Whitfield apparently took a big chance on Cheswell Miwash in 1960, and that confidence in, in, in Cheswell Miwash was more than vindicated with the Nobel in 1980. I think Whitfield retired in about 19, uh, 
Uh, no, actually, well, Whitfield was on campus until into the 1990s. You might be right about that. It might be about 1986. He, came, he, he spent a lot of time in his office as an emeritus in Dwinnell. Um, any record of Whitfield's reaction to Miwosh's great success that Berkeley had helped make possible? I don't know of any. Um, I didn't. I didn't uh, go through his records. Um, we know that he's. He's. You know, Miwosh wrote this Abetse was the Miwosh's ABCs, and Whitfield is one of one one of the one of the letters. And I know that uh, when Miwosh gave a copy of that book to to Whitfield's, um, I think at that point, wid widow Selena, <laughs> she was not for, for some reason not oh, amused. Um, but it was a great. Uh, well, it was, yeah, it was a great tribute, um, and you know, it's a relatively thin book. So obviously, Whitfield stood all those years later. So that book came out, I think, in the nineteen nineties. This is the next um, question is from David uh, Korakowski. Um, Thank you for some great reflections, Cynthia. Two small questions, specifically about the real the relationship between Miwosh and the Slavic department at Berkeley, in which he was housed. Um, could you say more about some of his relationships with the other Slavic faculty? I'm curious in particular about the one other Polish literary scholar, uh, one of the other Polish literary scholars, Václav Lednitsky. Uh, they must have intersected briefly and his very own successor, my own professor, David Frick. I don't know of his relations. I mean, he was he had friends on the, among the faculty, Leonard Nathan, uh, who encountered him in the library. Um, mm. I don't know if you know that story. Uh, Go ahead. Leonard Nathan uh, had just reviewed one of his books in a, a I can't remember which book, and um, bumped into him in the library and said, you know, I, I find your work very interesting, but I, I do have a question. Um, you seem, you, you, you say that you're a practicing Catholic, and yet, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember the story exactly. Um, did I have a question about your heresies? And and Miloš said, and how do you think I as a Catholic feel <laughs> or something to that effect? Um, I'm spoiling the joke somehow. Um, but they became friends and Leonard, I believe Leonard Nathan translated some of his work too. Um, so there was, and of course there was Robert Haas um, who, who came on the scene and the, uh, I can't remember when he came to Berkeley, but uh, they met at an international poetry festival and Robert Haas su suggested that his uh, poems could be translated better. And uh, he became Miwosh's foremost translator. Um, Bob is an amazing guy too. And uh, Sorry, I, I, I think we lost you for a little bit, Cynthia. Could you- um... Okay, How, when did you lose me? About a, a minute ago. I don't know whether that's true for, for Zach and Jeff as well, but um, I just I just mentioned that. Um, are you losing on my side or on your side? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's hard to say. But in any case, would you just maybe reiterate what you said in the last minute? Um, well, I, I mentioned that he met Leonard Nathan. Um, I got that. You know. Got the Leonard Nathan. He met uh, Robert Haas at an international poetry festival. It was kind of an inevitability. They both had the same. Um, uh, publisher, Dan Halpern of Echo, and they both um, lived nearby. Um, and Haas suggested that his poems could be, tried to diplomatically suggest that his um, poems could be translated more effectively. And as a result, they formed a very close collaboration and it uh, revolutionized Bob Haas's life. He's, um, that was a, a great good fortune for both of them. Um, it said that Bob Haas still can't have a half hour conversation without bringing me Wosh into the conversation. Yeah, but um, did you have a sense when you were you were you were researching the Berkeley part of um, your story that he he was in some ways a bit of an outsider? I, my sense in the Slavic department was that he he felt himself to be a little on the on, on the outside and and on, in the department as a whole, and maybe. Uh, confronting California culture, um, the house on Grizzly Peak is 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 almost like a refuge. You know, it's it's high oh, above yes. the city, oh, yes. and right, it's 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 like an escape almost from <laughs> from a lot of things. Uh, it's its own world, and uh, so I, 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 you know, one wonders uh, life of a great a great poet, a great a great man, um, what impact it had being here versus perhaps being somewhere else, like 
Paris, where he spent um, all those years, you know, a full decade in very difficult circumstances, and then and, and such an unlikely tran tra tra transference from, you know, from from Paris, where there's this very dense, uh, opinionated and uh, cultural intellectual atmosphere. He said that when he landed there in the early 50s, it was like being in Warsaw because he was once again among Stalinists. It was it was as though the intellectual, you know, the, the sort of the milieu had 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 hardly shifted, but coming out to California, I don't know. I mean, it, it always seemed somehow that there, it was difficult to fit in. And I, this is maybe a bit of David's question. I mean, whether, whether he did find a sort of a circle or, a, um, or, or whether he was in, indeed kind of um, a refugee in a way all those years, not, not really part of the, of the surroundings. What's, do you have an impression about that, um, having thought about this and written oh, about it? By then, another, you, might, you mentioned uh, Berkeley colleagues, uh, Peter Dale Scott, um, although he had a, a somewhat different position with the university, but that became a close friendship, and I described that in the book. Um, he was very much on his own wavelength, I think. He very, as I said, he was very, whether or not he realized it consciously, he very much had a mission. And um, there weren't many Polish colleagues. Um, uh, there, I, there were a, a few, but the Slavic departments of universities have always been been dominated by Russianists. Um, but he brought into a circle and he was training all these students to be translators. <laughs> and I mean, it just, it's, the output is enormous. I mean, you look at the, the history of Polish literature, it's a book like that. And that was just in the first few years he was here. It's an extraordinary work of, of history and literature of both. Um, you mentioned, so you, go ahead. He's a great historian. I mean, he was, yes. for me, at least, uh, that, that was the, one of the revelations. Is, it was his historic knowledge and consciousness. You mentioned that this is something he brought up with, with, uh, with uh, uh, Lurie in their first encounters um, in the early 1960s. And I was, uh, I was struck that in his letter to, to Kissinger, he was able to, to cite Thomas Jefferson. Yes. <laughs> what is this Polish Omar, yeah. reading, reading yes. Thomas Jefferson, you know? But, uh, uh, go ahead. Something we shouldn't forget. And uh, the Fernacek bi biography brought it forth. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm glad that Tony was open about it um, with me. Um, the enormous suffering in his home life has not really been sufficiently, I think, weighed. The death of his first wife, which took, what, two decades? A slow inching thing where eventually he was having to bathe her and feed her. Um, and then his younger son um, going mad, mm. you know, pulling out a gun in Berkeley and you know, having a hit list of professors he wanted to get. <laughs> I think professors were on it. I'm not sure if they were the whole list. That must have been an extraordinary humiliation for a man who had tried to live as a good citizen. I mean, this was the place that had given him a refuge. And dealing with these crises, in the Fernacek book, he says that... Um, he would have been happy to give up. He was, he prayed that he would be happy to relinquish the Nobel for his son's sanity. Um, so I think that that would be terribly isolating to yes. be a caregiver of two members of your family. Yes. Um, well, I got a sense from the letter to Kissinger also that he had a, a deep commitment to the, how shall we put it, the, you know, the, um, the unfreedom um, that um, was the um, the fate of uh, of Lithuania, Poland, and the other states, an area that was largely forgotten um, and, and and dismissed by a lot of American intellectuals, especially on the left. Um, there was this sense that that the, these states, in, in, in a sense, had opted for authoritarian and right wing regimes in the 1930s, and communism somehow was a was was a force that 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 could um, keep them uh, in line in a way, almost a kind of historic justice. And so it's interesting. So I, I always thought of, of, of Miłosz as, as being a man of the center left and his, his his basic instincts. Very um, unusual for Polish intellectuals. He was completely tolerant. He had no, you know, not not a whiff of of, of national national sentiment at all. Um, very uh, unusual in his period as well in, in the 1930s when he was a student in Vilna. He was, a, he, but but in in the U.S. he must have come across as sort of a cold warrior. And I'm I'm wondering whether 
you know, the perception of him in a place like Berkeley would have been that he was a, you know, the, the man with the cane. <laughs> sure. I think I, I think the cane, I think, was my imagination, <laughs> but he didn't say that. <laughs> I imagined him with a cane and made him more dramatic that way. Um, yes, I mean, that that was a, a, a source of some discomfort and he, he had been considered a left winger in, the, uh, in Poland. Uh, yeah. And then you come to America and you're the same person and suddenly the whole political world is turned uh, around on the like the, the other side of the moon and you're suddenly considered a right winger um, because you're not ready to embrace um, embrace some of the excesses of the, of the 60s, shall we say. Yes. Uh, but he was still the same person. Uh, but I think his... The free speech movement, you know, the changing of a, he was deplored the uh, Berkeley's move to eliminate foreign language study. I think that was it. Um, there was a scene, and I don't remember who he was with, where they they were. Uh, we saw the students destroying some books, and it, it brought back memories for those who had been around the Nazis. Mm -hmm. You know, in Nazi occupied over where he worked for for a library. Um, Yes, in Warsaw during the yeah. war. Yeah, um, but he did. He did. He did seem to, to find at least the you know the the the, the quiet and, and and the peace that he needed for some extraordinary uh, productivity of poems, but also prose. A, num a number of autobiographical works. Um, the um, I'm guessing that his um, native realm was was written in Berkeley. Is that is that accurate? Well, most of his books were written in Berkeley. I mean, all his books were written in Berkeley till he could go back in the 1980s. And then he spent, as you pointed out, only a couple months a year. Then there was martial law was declared and he was closed out again. Um, there were letters. I mean, whole the, his output was so enormous. I remember Tony Miloš describing to me his father getting up in the middle of the night and going to his books and wanting to learn more I, the the amount of learning of the man he's just endless and yes. and we don't have all his stuff in english yet there are, i mean there are whole volumes of his correspondence that exist in poland uh and not here um you know he's an extraordinary scholar that's uh, i think so whitfield was was on to something when he called him here to be a professor even uh, he, though he didn't, he didn't have his PhD. I remember my, my colleague Nick, Nicholas Riazanowski recalling many years later that there had been some objections at that point, so 1959-60, that Miłosz, how can you call him to Berkeley as a professor? He has no PhD. And I think uh, Riazanowski said, or, or maybe it was Whitfield said, a, a poet does not need a PhD, something along those lines. In other words, it's a high, yeah. even higher calling than than a, a doctorate would be. But but Whitfield said that. Uh, Whitfield said it. Yeah. Okay. I wish I'd known that I would have put that in the book. Yeah, it might have been either Ryazanovsky or, you know, who was a you know, extremely impressive and, and cultivated world uh, mm -hmm. scholar, a, ref, a refugee of, uh, you know, an emigre family as well. But but I, I, I remember seeing me was just sitting, um, this would have been in, in, in the 90s, in um, the very bottom of, of Doe Library, just pouring through some 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 volumes. He he had an intense interest in, in theology and in... in um, you mentioned this this fellow coming upon him and asking him why he was a heretic. <laughs> well, you know, he he knew he wrote his essays about um, was it Swedenborg? I think he wrote a very long essay on Swedenborg that appeared in in English translation. Um, and and all of this stuff w w was was done with deep knowledge. It, it was not at all uh, impressionistic. This was not, in other words, these these are not essays, right? The, the, the um, the um, um, the volumes that have, have appeared of his of his writings long, long pieces on Swedenborg or um, you know various figures in Polish Polish um, history are, are not simple essays they're they're deeply learned with solid what we would call an academic apparatus and um, there's also this very long correspondence of his with with Thomas Merton who was a uh, yes. um, so again um, and in the course of the correspondence he's bemoaning the fact that they're in Berkeley. And the kids are watching television. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For me, was this is the you know this is the absolutely unacceptable. You see, it's interesting. So this 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 left leaning figure, very left figure from from interwar Poland, suddenly confronted with culture in California, suddenly seems to be taking on these characteristics of, of a kind of a snob and a, 
and a conservative. But he says to, to Merton that the only thing worth reading at that point is theology, which is also, you know, it's an unusual uh, point of view. But obviously, from what you're telling us, he was reading a lot of a lot a lot of other things as well. Well, I mean, it, it was just that. I mean, the, the, there's the story Robert Haas um, tells about how he came to the house one day and he was reading some huge book on women's underwear in the late 19th century <laughs> with pictures Typical Bob was saying what is this for and he wanted to know what he saw on the clotheslines as a boy in Lithuania <laughs> maybe he was going to put it in a poem or something but you know for myself I think this is how we learn is by having the example of someone like that around us um, I was a student of Joseph Brodsky. That was very formative for me. Mm -hmm. um, Miłosz, much later in my life, has been very formative too. The intellectual aspiration, the restlessness, the... Jerzy Il, the Maznak publisher, you know, calls him continent Miłosz. Continent uh, Miłosz. Uh -huh. the, he refers to the continent Miłosz. I, I think that might be too... Um, I think it's the planet me. <laughs> it's, it's, there was a, a, an endlessness to his learning, to his output. And you're talking about isolation. That is also isolating to, you know, to, to be doing that, that much, to be writing that much, to be taking care of a family, to be training translators to, and he still had time for vodka. So. <laughs> Um, we have a question from um, from from Lu Luba Goldberg. Um, Hello, Luba. <laughs> she says, um, "Thank you, Cynthia, for this moving tribute. I look forward to reading the book. I have two questions about your work as a biographer. One, you are clearly a very sympathetic biographer. There were some wonderful moments where you read from your book, and I caught myself not knowing whether you were quoting Miłosz or narrating. Were there moments in your work?" when you felt you couldn't understand Miłosz, couldn't sympathize, or did not know how, how to narrate. And the second question um, is about going from writing about Girard to writing about Miłosz. Did the switch require some shift or adjustment for you as a biographer? Uh, well, my current project is I'm doing um, by invitation of a Penguin Anthology for René Girard. So I do feel like I've been toggling <laughs> back and forth between these uh, two very different sensibilities, uh, very different bodies of work. At the same time to both men uh, and also to Joseph Brodsky, because I, I came out with a book. Oh gosh, you didn't mention that. The, the, I did a book length, a short book on a conversation with George Klein about uh, Joseph Brodsky. All three men are, are in and there, you know, an endless inspiration in the inspiration is such a cheap word. Um, Stimulus, um, maybe a spore. They're, they're a standard. They're, they're something that kind of to aspire to, for lack of a better word. Um, I wouldn't have, I think if you're going to spend this much time with someone, uh, you you better like them fundamentally. You better admire them fundamentally because it's a lot of, I don't know how Richard Lurie wrote the autobiography of Joseph Stalin. <laughs> That's a mind I wouldn't want to be in for 15 minutes. I, I guess we should be glad someone did it. So I, I don't, Luba's question, uh, was it narration versus... Well, let me, uh, I'll, I'll uh, retreat. Okay. Were there moments in your work when you felt you couldn't understand me, Wash, couldn't sympathize, or did not know how to narrate? That's part of the first question. Okay. I think he had a harsh side. I think that uh, he could be unsympathetic towards lazy students. I think... Um, Something that's been treated very gently has been the uh, his treatment of women. <laughs> um, the difficult liaison between the death of his second, second wife, who was dying, you know, you know, as he was beginning a new relationship. On the other hand, those of us who have been close to that situation, 
know how hard it is for the surviving spouse. And I can say, I can even sympathize with that. One doesn't have to. Um, I don't think I did find anything that I couldn't understand or sympathize. Maybe you can re refresh my memory of something that was horrific. He was not always brave. He was not always fair. Um, I guess I have enough of that in myself that I can sympathize with other people's lapses. I found him admirable still. The second uh, question is about going from writing about Rene Girard to writing about Miwosh. Did the switch require a shift or an adjustment from you as a biographer? Um, I think with Rene, I was the first person writing about his life. So there was this great, um, okay, well, Rene, we can talk about foibles of Chesov Miwosh. Rene really was such an exemplary person. He was a wonderful husband. His children adore him. <laughs> he was a wonderful. Um, and there was a lack of instant incident in the external life. Um, and nothing had been written about it. So you were having um, to contextualize things. Um, more to, um, you know, he went through World War II, but he didn't seem to have done, he was never working with the resistance or anything like that. With Miwosh, it was kind of the opposite. There was so much going on in the life. There were so many incidents. There was, you really had to be selective. And I keep, kept having to pull myself into the interaction with America because Andre Fernacek wrote a marvelous, what is it in Polish, a thousand page biography. <laughs> that didn't need to be done again. What needed to be done was to take this particular slice. So in one case, you're widening the aperture. In the other case, you're kind of zeroing in and making sure that you, you can stay on target. We have a, a question from Polina Barskova um, from our Slavic department. W what is the importance or the problem of Miłosz for our contemporary historical moment. Oh, also thank you for your book of interviews of Brodsky. Um, so what, what would you say to that, or his importance for our contemporary historical moment? He died 2004. I mean, this is a moment he couldn't have anticipated. Um, do you have any? I talk a lot about that in the book, about how he anticipated much of what's Coming from well, you point out his you know reaction to television. He was already seeing um, the pollution of the mind, as he called it. Um, mm. That we worry a good deal, and rightly so, about pollution of the water, pollution of the air. No one is worrying about pollution of the mind. That has only become more true um, in the years since his death. Uh, certainly, his just. Um, he was an exemplar in a way of just um, his aspiration. I guess that in the way that way he and Rene are, are, are alike. His wish to understand everything, his wish to encompass everything, the wicked as well as the is the good. Um, I mean, you know, some of his poems probe that. Um, Pardon me, I've, I've kind of lost track of the question. Uh, his importance for our contemporary historical moment. Thank you. Well, that's it. I think he was, I call him a prophet of Etra. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's what I said. It's Twitter, it's TikTok, it's... Mm -hmm. um, yeah the wish for more and more leisure, the ability to have more and more leisure and to fill it in less meaningful ways. The loss of meaning in the world was a big concern of his and a whole topic in itself. Um, his whole notion of second space, you, you know that concept in his work, um, the loss of the kind of religious imagination that can imagine a heaven, a hell, an alternate universe, whatever. Um, 
I think that that might be why he turned to the mountains of Parnassus for science fiction as a way of expanding our notion of the possible and of of the space. We've lost that. It's um, it's a consumer society. He was saying that when he first came in the 1940s, you know, to New York and Washington. It's become more so. Everything's become accelerated. He knew that and he saw that and he decried it. Now he didn't have a soapbox. I talk about the speech that he gave at Santa, Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, decrying some of these things as he saw them. But certainly I think he speaks to that in our moment. And that's that's another reason I wanted to do this book. I think it's it's something that should be heard more. I uh, have a question from Roman Koropetsky, um, tuning in from UCLA. Um, could you speak a bit more about his relationship with American poets, particularly Robertson, Robinson Jeffers? I have a whole chapter on that. <laughs> Not a whole chapter, but a, a good portion of his chapter. Um, he was horrified by Robinson Jeffers. Much has been written about his relationship with Robinson Jeffers. Um, he was horrified and intrigued. He wrote a poem about that. Better to carve moons and suns and moons on, you know, than to, to say as you did as a human thing. But we're back to that notion of second space again. Somebody that could... Robinson Jeffers had a very large vision. It was a very American vision. He prefigured the environmental movement uh, that began to grow in the 1980s. He was horrified by that inhumanism. You know, the, the, the for Jeffers' ability to foresee or, or with not pleasure, um, but to look forward to the elimination of man from the earth, where the earth will only be filled with rocks and sea and hawks again. Um, to me, well, that was a kind of blasphemy. But he was intrigued with the daring, as he was by Allen Ginsberg's daring. He thought it was deplorable to expose his mother in the way he does in Kaddish. But he admired the daring, the, the pushing of a poetic frontier, which Robinson Jeffers did too. And um, there's, a, there's a brief correspondence uh, between Ginsberg and uh, Miboche at Beinecke, po po Ginsburg, I think it was mostly just Ginsburg sending him postcards. <laughs> but um, at one point he said to Miboche, this has got to do with the left right thing again. You know, you're not as much of a square as, as you look. <laughs> oh. And Miboche repeated that again and again. <laughs> I can inject uh, maybe an anecdote from uh, his visit, one of his last visits to Berkeley, he went over, he was, David Frick and I were supposed to meet with him for a drink, and he and Yeji Ilk had, been, had spent the day oh. smoking pot somewhere in Marin. <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't they weren't up for meeting us for a drink. I don't know, that would have been around 2000, uh, I think. Now who was smoking the pot? I think it was it was Czesław, Yeji Ilk, and um, <laughs> someone else over in Marin, where one does, you know, well. That, that's my recollection. David could maybe fill in the gap. Um, so he wasn't a square. That's, that's he right. wasn't a square. Maybe, yes. Um, I was just remember, uh, what was surprising is during his diplomatic, I'm looking for the passage I wrote, um, how eagerly during his stay in New York, uh, particularly Washington DC was not as fruitful. He really tried to get to know every major writer and um, poet, especially uh, in New York. And I had a list of the people. He went to the Breadloaf Conference, of, what was it, 1947? Um, he was the cultural attache of Poland, right? So in a sense, that was- Well, he was the cultural attache to the US, yes. Um, it's not a, an elevated diplomatic position. It's, I've been told it's the lowest ranking person. Mostly you organize cultural exchanges, which during the Cold War weren't happening anyway. So that gave him a lot of free time to go and hobnob with writers. And, um, and Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein. Um, I can't find the list of uh, poets that he, oh, here it is. He wrote his writing columns for poems uh, for uh, Poland uh, publications. He was discussing Robert Lowell, T.S. Eliot, E.E. E. Cummings, Carl Shapiro. He wrote an article on William Faulkner, who he considered the greatest living author. 
because mm -hmm. of his consistent strength of vision. He reviewed Car William Carlos Williams' uh, new volume of 1947 uh, Breadloaf Conference. He would have probably met Robert Frost. He translated Whitman, Markham, Carol Sandburg, Rachel Lindsay, Negro, Negro Spirituals, and more. I mean, that is an astonishing amount of work for somebody who at least has a as the title of cultural attaché. Um, then I have uh, Peter Dale Scott's speculation that he must have met Auden, though we have no record for it. Um, he was a good friend with Thornton Wilder. Um, Thornton Wilder helped his family when he was unable to return to uh, America and when he was stranded in France. So, um, Again, the industry and energy is just uh, inspirational if you want to rise to the challenge. Question from Irina Paperno. Um, Hello, Irina. <laughs> your subtle empathy has shown in the way you read the remarkable moments from Miwosh at Berkeley. The theme in these episodes, or most of them, was misunderstanding. Miwosh and, and Vought, speaking of Berkeley being Lubyanka. <laughs> Would it be would it be fair to describe the relationship as mutual misunderstanding? The relationship of Vat and Miwosh, or maybe maybe Vat and maybe Miwosh and Berkeley. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think there was a lot of mutual under mis misunderstandings with Berkeley. Um, he was always on his own way, wavelength. I think you know. I think he did an enormous. I I, I recounted the Vat incident with Lubyanka because it's um it's kind of humorous to us that anyone would equate Berkeley uh with the Lubyanka but I think that Miloš put it very well where he said in America you're just ex in California in particular uh like Miloš I've lived in California for 40 years so we both had that that was my premise when I began the book is like you, you can't live 40 years in a place and not be of that place it gets to you but um, in California, it's more extreme. The the independence that we pride so much, it's it really is, you know, as, as Mibo said, you want to give a lecture, give it. You don't, don't. What's the problem? There's no meeting in the coffee shops beforehand, no discussions in the newspapers of what was said. No, there's no ferment around intellectual events that way or not much. And that made it a very lonely place, I think, for someone like Alexander Vaught, who needed that kind of support. And you don't get it here. Um, you're very much on your own. We're used to that. I am. It made me more aware of myself as an American, too. Um, and, uh, and so with that little incident with Vaught, I could very much understand both points of view. The American one of, you know, we're not going to coddle you. You're here. We got you the plane ticket. Be happy. <laughs> and at the same time, the need for a supportive community. Well, I talk about that too, as um, one of the chapters was published in the Notre Dame Church Life Journal. Um, I talk about the effects of radical Protestantism on American thinking and the way we view the world. And the difference between that and Poland, which is essentially a Catholic country, and the idea of community, the basic unit is not the individual, it's the family, it's the household, it's the community. And in America, you're supposed to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you know, do it yourself. My revelation, very Blakeian, which is interesting because Miłosz liked Blake, but he, so he was drawn to both. But this, I mean, it's the Ginsburg is the, you know, I want the angels to come to me. I want my own re revelation. I want my own ass or whatever it takes versus this idea of community enlightenment, community uh, coming together. Um, and it, it's not just religious, it permeates all aspects of society. And there is more support in Poland. When I first went to Poland, I felt very much an outsider because I didn't, I wasn't part of the inside. <laughs> I wasn't in any of those enclaves. I learned to be. It's interesting that over the over the years, um, uh, Miłosz remained closely connected to the uh, the Polish intel intellectual establishment, even 
when for, for the decades when he couldn't go back to Poland, he was he was constantly reading what they were writing and thinking about what they were. In other words, you speak of community, this intellectual community, it continued. And of course, it, it, there, there's a um, um, Gustav Herling Grudzinski, I think he lived in Naples for many years. There's a huge Polish community in, in Paris and in London and New York, Chicago. Um, yeah. and, and so he's, he's sort of an outpost uh, out here, you know, on the Pacific of, yes. of the Polish intellectual world. But uh, it's also remarkable to me that over all those years, his poll, <laughs> it's going to sound silly, but, um, and maybe it's reflect it's reflective of the, the way in which he, he remained sort of uh, an outsider at, at some level is that he, he continued to, to, to write and think and, and produce poetry in Polish. There are cases where, where intellectuals go abroad, become emigres and stop doing that. Like M Milan Kundera at some point began writing in French, right? But- Brodsky. <laughs> Right. Um, Miłosz never went never went in that direction. So, when you talk about his 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 contacts and his his his, his uh, frenetic ac activity, it also involved being a mentor to to, to generations, successive generations of, of of young Polish intellectuals who looked up to him. Michnik, for example, had boundless admiration uh, for Miłosz, and it was it was grounded also in, in an encounter with texts, with writings, right, with both poet poetry as well as historical works. Or Stanisław Barańczak. Um, and I mentioned Branchak was my, my teacher when I was at, at, at Harvard. I actually took a believe I in, you. <laughs> seminar in translation with him. I mean, not that I, I found it really, really interesting. But when I mentioned Branchak to Miłosz, he said, a magnificent creature. That's what he said. You know, so it's clear that the, the, this, this sort of, um, you know, the, this, when you speak of community, it was not just family. It was, you know, it was, it went over generations and, and somehow... His mind was was always in Poland over all those years, so he was here, but in in in, in some vital sense, he wa he wasn't here. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't yeah. you agree? I mean, um, and that's one of us and not one of us. Yes, it's not it's not it's not a, a standard kind of kind of experience that an emigre has, um, where at some point you sort of cut, cut the cut the cut the cut the ties. He even when he couldn't go back, he 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 didn't cut them. And of course, then came that magnificent moment. Uh, of the Nobel Prize and solidarity. So solidarity meant that suddenly for a brief period, he could go back, right? So this would have been what, the fall of 1980. And then there are pictures of him in Krakow among his friends from, you know, from Znak and Tygodnik Powszechny. That m must have been, I mean, did, did you have a sense of that being maybe a, uh, you know, a, I don't know, a, uh, not a, maybe a revelatory moment, but for him, a, uh, well, a gift in a way, you know, the, the ability to return to this place where he had never ceased being intellectually and then sort of physically to be able to go back there and for, for a brief period, early 1980s. Do you, am yeah, I, mean, I right about that? Is there it's anything? kind of funny, isn't it? Because he kept in touch with people, you know, people came and did pilgrimages. Yes. Um, and at the same time, you know, in that moment when he could go back, it's like Helen Wendler, the American critic said, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking for the quote. I'm not going to be able to find it, so I might as well just give up. He he couldn't see it before. He didn't. He knew theoretically that you know he was, but he didn't. And then he goes to Poland for the first time after since you know 1951, and he's being mobbed in the streets, and crowds are following him. And the what was it? A press run of a, one of his books went out and sold out a hundred thousand copies in the first few days, and. And he was stunned because he didn't know he had an audience. You know, it was one of those things I think he, maybe he knew he had an audience or suspected it, but he didn't know because he hadn't seen. That's what Helen Venner said. He knew he, he hadn't seen. And mm -hmm. suddenly it's not just thinking you might have an audience or wondering, but it was actual having people, you know, weeping in front of him. Um, and it was, but as I, 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 I was told um, uh, by, um, I think it was Henrik Wojniakowski said to me that he felt a little uncomfortable at, at suddenly being not just a national bard, but kind of a national, a national or even nationalist hero. He represented something that was more, much more than, you know, his his, his identity as 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 a, as a great uh, poet, as a Nobel Prize winner. There was something he was he was part of this sort of pantheon of great of great poles. He didn't feel very comfortable being thought about that way. Um, he didn't want to be a statue. <laughs> 
or just or just admired for the wrong reasons, you know, as you know, yes. in other words, or not or, or by people who wouldn't read his poetry, but would think of him, you know, would think of him, he's our noblista, right? That yes. one more noblista after the last one would have been Raymond or someone like someone like, you know, much, much earlier. Um, so in other words, being being a focal point of national pride, I think he didn't feel comfortable with that. Well, he's far too complex to be yes. put to that kind of mold. Yes, okay. uh, he's, amb is, he's ambivalent about everything. I mean, he, he he's um, if you erase the amb ambiguities and the ambivalences, you're erasing him. I mean, you know, that's a great that's a great a great sentence, and maybe that would be a good place for us to. I don't see any any further questions. Maybe that'd be a good place for us to adjourn our meeting. Um, well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, yes. all of you, John and, yeah, it's been... and Jeff and. Yeah, it's like it's like reestablishing contact with this 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 man who, <laughs> you know, once 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 uh, lived here and uh, you know and, and was such an important presence. So it's it's great to, in a, in a sense through this conversation to have have him back. Well, I hope he's still alive in your classrooms because we have so much to learn from him still. Yes, well, certainly in anything we do on East Central Central Europe, modern Europe, he's 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 there. <laughs> great. So. Um, so I want to uh, thank you all for for uh, attending and uh, thanks again to Cynthia. This was really a very special um, encounter for, for us. Uh, thank you for having me. Okay. Be well, everyone. <laughs>